boy on, I think. Yeah, we can we can see you. Oh shit. <laughs> So first of all, you have a whole kind of room of people that want to wish you happy birthday. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, of oh. course. <laughs> of can't, course. Uh, can't we see you? Why, why can't we see um, you? Can I, I'm in the bottom. I'm at the bottom. Here, look. I'm oh, waving wait, my wait. phone. Can you see? I'm waving my phone. Wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm oh, a, sorry, a bit of an... his phone on me, so I'm kind of here. Can you see? I mean, no, everyone well, I wants to... Uh, it's more important to see these guys, I think. Than uh, me. I, I, sorry, I'm a bit of an ignorant. Yes, yes, I can see you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I Hi. love you. Happy birthday. Thank <laughs> you. I love you more. Um, Thank you, everyone. So, I mean, I'm going to talk to the audience um, first. I, I first saw this film last night. I was very lucky to have a preview screening of it, of course, because I need to speak to these two incredible women about this film. And um, it's incredible to watch it again tonight because I see so many different things in the movie that I didn't really necessarily see a couple of nights ago. And I want to spend most of my time not really talking about Beirut and Lebanon because I feel that this is almost secondary to the film. Um, as well as being a central kind of character. But I, I want to talk about the characters in the film. I want to talk about the family. I want to talk about the feelings because I think most people in this room would be able to relate to those people in some way. Um, and I'll start with, with you, Munia, because I felt watching it um, <coughs> the first time, but definitely the second time, that this is an autobiographical journey for you in, in many ways. Um, and, and I saw you in, actually, in many of the characters. I felt that this was you telling your story. And I saw you in Rim, I saw you in Tala, I saw you in Walid, I saw you in Saraya. And I want, I want to talk to you a little bit about that and about how this was a journey for you and telling sort of your story and your coming of age as a woman, really. Uh, thank you so much, Ruth. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And to everyone in the room, I wish we were here with you. I'm so, so moved uh, by the fact that it's a full house and um, we really felt your energy <laughs> during. Uh, Ruth was texting me while the movie was happening. Sorry. Um, so about the characters, I think, uh, obviously I'm in of these characters and, and so many of the people I know as well, uh, a lot of research and a lot of life brought these characters into my life. And uh, like I was telling you, Ruth, uh, earlier, like like in dreams, that uh, every character in your dream somehow is a version of herself. I think that in this film, those characters really help explore some of my desires, fears, uh, hopes, and, and subconscious uh, feelings as well for them. And then give those characters to actors and that starts growing and growing and amazing. For example, I think that I wanted to explore through Edim uh, the anxiety I've inherited maybe from uh, my parents because I was in my father, my, not my father's, my mother's belly uh, when the civil war ended. And so I didn't live the war, but I lived it now. Uh, and I feel like, um, I inherited a lot of things that I wanted to explore. I wanted to explore through the character of Dean, her obsession with her father, her desire to protect her family and realizing that maybe you cannot do that as a child. Uh, through Dala, I wanted to explore um, not just adolescence, but also like existing as a woman in, in a country where you feel like your most deep desires, you're not allowed to express. So they become in this secret zone, which is your mind. Through Walid, I wanted to explore my cynicism and my fear of, of, of a place I feel I, I've lost, that I refuse to lose. And through Sudeya, I think I wanted to explore my questions about motherhood, about career, and my, my nostalgia and my love for the city and, for, and that hope that somehow um, doesn't go no matter how hurt you are. And then you feel stupid about that as well. But anyway, I will talk with Nadine about that. And through Zina, I wanted to talk my feelings that because of my career and my relationship to my work, sometimes I feel like I haven't lived life enough. I've, I've self-censored a lot because of that. And, and so, yes, it was kind of like a, 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 a lot of a big personal journey, those characters. And the most beautiful thing is when you give them to actors and then that becomes a whole new journey. 
Well, we'll we'll go into a little bit of detail on each of the characters because I think when you delve a bit deeper into each of them, this is where the fascination really starts to kind of give lots of uh, amazing uh, stories. I think Walid uh, is probably the most misunderstood in the film. Um, it's interesting that there's a certain fear about him in a lot of the family members, especially Tala, and yet he seems to be the most scared of everyone in the film. Um, he's so fearful. Um, he watches this world crumble around him, a world that he built to be so idyllic and so precious. Tell us a little bit about Walid, because I know that there are certain, um, there's a certain love, especially that you feel for him. Um, and I'm a little bit like you. I didn't see him as being this fearful character. I f my heart was breaking for him, actually, um, because he... He was in, in trying to protect this amazing family. He was also trapping them. And yeah, this is a really interesting part of the film for me about how people start to turn on him in, in, the, in the end. Tell us a little bit about his character. Yes, definitely. Um, me and, and Nadine are both defenders of Wade. Whenever people think that he's too tough, Nadine is the first one to say, no, I agree. <laughs> there was a conflict today, and Nadine this sometimes, but I'll, I'll let her speak about that after. Uh, I think Walid definitely is driven by fear because I think he loves the roots more, more than anyone. And, and his relationship to the city is one of a, of a broken hearted person. I think um, Walid's desire to control everything around him comes from the fact that he lost everything he's ever fought for. And, and he somehow doesn't know what to do to feel safe anymore and to uh, make the people he loves feel safe anymore. And so he's developed this, this, this desire to control everything around him, but that is really linked to how broken he feels, and even if sometimes it, he's a tough character to understand, I think uh, I really understand him. And the character and Saleh Bakri, who plays Walid, knows a thing or two about like losing something you love, and and he really put a lot of that into into his performance. And he had just recently become a father, and and apart from that, um, uh, uh, the the little girl, the twins who play the character of Reem, also really fell in love with uh, Walid, and that became a very interesting dynamic. Um, Nadine, you want to talk about Walid a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I want to know what your <laughs> thoughts are on uh, on Walid, and then we'll talk about Soraya. I mean, I love I love Walid's uh, Walid's character, and I and I sort of empathize, empathize with him because, um, I, you know, if, a few weeks ago, uh, a few months ago, actually, I, I came across an interview. In, um, on, on the Lebanese TV and uh, there was this nurse that was a uh, Lebanese nurse that was leaving the country. Um, um, for, I mean, indefinitely, she was leaving uh, everything behind and she was saying that Lebanon is like a is like a drug. It's uh, it's both addictive, but but also very destructive at the same time. So, I truly um, empathize with with uh, Walid's character because this is a relationship with uh, really what's happening in Lebanon, and uh, there's a huge. Um, sort of confusion or contradiction or mixed emotions. Uh, and you see this film and in, in, in every character in this film as a sort of a tribute, every Lebanese who is sort of living this struggle between uh, do we uh, stay and, and be part of uh, the resistance in a way and be, be part of of this transition that our country is going through, because I truly believe that there is a transition happening, um, or or do we leave? Uh, because this is, if if we if we are sane, uh, we can say that maybe this is the, the our common sense says that this is the right decision that we need to leave to protect our families. Because in a country like Lebanon, where everything is so unstable we sort of feel that the only maybe way to protect our children or to protect our family is really to leave um, uh, and find some other place who, that is more safe. So I, I truly identify with, with Walid's character at sense. Um, I think in each, every one of us Lebanese is, is living the same uh, dilemma. And I don't think also it's, it's only a dilemma that Lebanese people are, are our feeling. I think it's the state of, of the world in a way. I mean, we, we are all aware that there's 
a shift that is happening. And we are all aware that the way things are going and this excessive consumerism and this global capitalism is not working anymore. There's something that is not working. So do we, um, do we stay and, and try to be part of the change or do we re retrieve, retrieve ourselves and we, you know, we live in a, in a sort of a bubble that is very protective, but at the same time we are, we are very disconnected from what's happening in the world. So it's, it's a big question. I think it's, it's a question that is very relevant now and that everybody identifies with. Uh, what is really the right way to live uh, what is wrong and who, who, who know? I mean, we don't really know what's wrong and, and what's right anymore. It's, it's, it's a, it, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a subject that is really relevant. And I, and I identify with each one of the characters in that sense. That's why I, 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 I empathize with Walid. Uh, I truly identify with what he's feeling. I think there's a certain part of Walid that just didn't have any answers either, because uh, it, through, throughout the movie, Soraya asks him so many questions and he just doesn't have the answers. Um, you know, will, you know, Beirut will change. He says Beirut will never change. She asks where they can run away to. He says there's nowhere to go. Like he doesn't have the answers either. So, and I, I see this interesting point of view with Alia because she's not really been very spoken about, you know, in everything that I've read in terms of the film, but she sums up for me a part of what you've been talking about Nadine, because in a way she is the person that left, but not necessarily to protect her family. And this was an interesting metaphor for me, uh, Munia, with Alia, because she was really sort of the expat in a way, you know, that, that left. And there was a couple of points uh, in the film where you sort of very, very subtly delve into that subject of the Lebanese expats and you use, you know, you use Alia to do so. Tell us a little bit about how you tried to weave that into the film and also if it's a little bit of a reflection of yourself. Oh, we've lost the Sorry, sound. I muted myself. No, no, I muted okay. myself earlier when I was coughing because I had COVID. <laughs> so, and so basically the character of Alia, um, I don't see myself as an expat I, because I lived, I, I was born and raised in Lebanon, lived there all my life and then went to New York for film school, came back to Lebanon. And then, and then I started traveling for the work. But so I, but I did feel like the, so Yumna Madwan, who plays Alia, who I've worked with on, on my short film, uh, Submarine, um, was actually out of the country around the time uh, uh, the explosion happened and everything that happened. So her coming back to Lebanon for the shoot was as challenging for her emotionally as the character of Alia coming back uh, for the, the funeral of, of, of the mother, of her own mother. The character of Alia, whenever I've traveled with the film, for example, in London, a lot of people kept telling me that they really found themselves in the character of this woman and they all came to me with this line repeating to me this line you know this line where we tell Suraya yeah go to with Alia yes. to Colombia and then tell me on social media how Lebanese your blood yeah. is and I think um uh, the character of Alia is a character who left because um she had no choice and preferred in the beginning living a life with less dignity outside than the life she was living inside and she represents this character that has left but lives is constantly on Lebanese news that Lebanon lives inside of her body and she, her biggest ache and her biggest wound is her relationship to the country. So much that her way to protect herself from it is to develop this like almost like uh, thick uh, skin that protects her from falling apart. And I think Yumna portrays that very well in the film, that pain, like when, when you're so worried that something will break you, that you create a big distance with it. And uh, it, it, it's her way of surviving, she left. And that's one type of, of expat. I do think that the Lebanese expat is a, is a very important part of Lebanese society and really injects a lot into the country. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> So, um, Nadine, let's talk a little bit about Soraya, because I saw so much of you in her, it's actually quite scary. And <laughs> with the, the place that they're living in the mountain is also so similar to where you live, um, that I, for one second at the beginning of the film, I thought it was your home, actually. And it's, it's very <laughs> similar in a way to how 
in a, you know, to what has happened to you in the last few years. So I, I really would love you to talk about that, especially because you've mentioned just the world in general about where we are right now in the state of the world. And I think so many people, uh, many people obviously also in this room as well, we don't quite know what to do with ourselves, I think. There's a certain part in everybody that's a little bit lost. And, and I really identified with this, and I'm sure so many people identified with this. We don't know what's happening in the world. We feel, we were always powerless, but we feel so much more powerless now because it's been so clear from the pandemic of the last couple of years that we don't know where we're going. We don't know where we are. And, you know, capitalism has taken over, especially when you look at the pandemic. So tell us a little bit about how you identified with Soraya in this sense, not only as an artist, because obviously she was, she, you know, in the movie, she's also a singer and, and you're an artist, but in the sense that she tried to protect her family to go to the mountain, she believed in it as well until the very end, in fact. So tell us a little bit about this. Um, yeah, actually, the, the, the first thing that um, that, you know, drew me to this uh, script and uh, apart from the fact I, I, I wanted to work with Monia uh, is is the fact that I then I, I identified so much with Soraya. It was uh, very surprising to see how much similar um, uh, I was I was uh, and I still am in a way. Uh, because, you know, like you said, um, when the pandemic started and, you know, everything that was happening also in Lebanon and the financial crisis and, and what happened in Beirut, it was very difficult to stay in, in Beirut. So we decided to live for a while um, a bit, um, you know, in, in, in nature, because I think there's in, in those situations, there's no no. Um, wiser i think way of living than to imitate nature i think um during those past two years uh, we've learned so much as a family and i've learned so much so much uh, from from this um close uh, close living uh, to nature um you know we've learned uh, how to become more uh, self-sufficient um, we have a sort of a small farm we have goats we make uh, our own cheese we make uh, we have our own chicken we we grow our own vegetables um and it was it was really a, a time where i i understood how much um you know nature is is wise and and how i think I'm, I'm definitely don't have the solution and I, I definitely don't have the answers, but I truly believe that there is a more alternative way of living. It doesn't mean it, it has to, you know, uh, be going back to nature, but nature is one of those, um, one of those, uh, um, I think uh, res re not resort, yeah, resource that we have to uh, go back to in a way, and and I identified so much with Soraya that I was, you know, very drawn to the character, and I decided that yeah, I was I was going to play it, and you know, so sometimes I, when I look back at the pictures, because I used to take so many pictures while we were shooting. Uh, um, uh, the film, uh, so many pictures of the locations because I was so fascinated. And sometimes I would go back and try to, you know, look at the pictures. And sometimes I, I would, I would think this is, you know, my home. It's so similar. I, I was sometimes I used to get confused. Um, uh, so this is, you know, I think I, I don't have the answer, but this is something I've we've been experimenting for the past um, uh, two or three years, and. And I think we have to start, you know, asking ourselves lots of questions about what is, you know, it doesn't mean that I have the answer again, but what is the alternative way of, of living? Because I think we've created as societies, we've created so much fear, we've created so much um, intolerance, we've, we, you know, that our systems have created, we've created those, you know, obstacles between people, uh, uh, we've create, built walls, we've, we've done so much, we've, we've destroyed um, our nature, and, and I think, and we've allowed, you know, this sort of um, uh, imbalance between uh, and this sort of uh, unfair uh, distribution of wealth. And I, I think we have to go back and 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 uh, re-question all of that. So my way of living the past two years was helping me also re-question all of it. 
Um, Munia, let's come back to you for a sec. I don't know how long we have actually, because they told me I could have 15 minutes to talk and then 15 minutes for questions, but I can keep going. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> Munia, you, you have the most unbelievable way of turning brutality into beauty. And, and this is something that comes through so strongly in the film that it's, it's heart wrenching and yet so astonishingly beautiful at the same time. And there's, there's one particular standout moment for me when it comes to Tala, because I want to talk about her for a second, because really the movie is the coming of age of Tala and it's painful and yet so poetic to watch her in action. And there's, a, there's one particular moment where you really turn trash into treasure when she goes through the trash and she's looking at these uh, clippings and you know, she's done something that in her heart she knows is really bad, but you know, her mind is telling her that she's looking at these beautiful mementos and this incredible treasure. Um, tell us a little bit about how you approach this subject, because you know, I saw that trash in so many ways, in as so many metaphors, but what did it mean to you as a backdrop to the film? You're still on mute. You're still on mute. <laughs> I, I unmuted myself. Sorry, everyone. Munia's had COVID, so, so she's coughing a lot. <laughs> You're okay? Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> uh, so uh, Tala is played by Nadia Sherville, and um, she brought so much to the character I wrote, like really, like in my wildest dreams, I couldn't have imagined to find someone that makes me feel so connected to a character that was uh, in, in my mind uh, with Clara, the co-writer. And um, what was really important for Nadia and I was to, um, through her, internal world explain how much she's been trapped all her life not necessarily by by her father but by her own self by the fact that she's a character that in her own home felt like um she never really spoke out at home she never felt like she was enough she always felt like she was in the shadow of her little sister who's like this force of nature who was fearless but actually more fearful than we think and i think what i really wanted to explore with tala is this girl whose internal world like really, really explodes and, and, and who uh, faces and starts facing those desires that she thought didn't have space in her home. And what happens for her is that the arrival of the garbage, so the world, men, fire, danger, uh, awakes that in her and, and gives her the courage to, you know, face it and look at it. And, and what I love about her, even if she ultimately, for example, gets rejected by, by Tare in that scene, what I love about that scene is that she's active in it. She goes and, and tries something and, and decides to pursue that thing and, and that world that her father or maybe herself protected herself from because I think that we also self-censor a lot. And I think her obsession with her mother and her mother's diaries and even with, for example, Beatrice Hadok, who, who worked so beautifully on the costumes in the film, uh, whether it's costumes that circulate between different characters because they haven't done shopping for eight years. I think through the, what she did with the character of Tala Beatrice is that she managed to show us her coming of age through wardrobe and through using her mother's wardrobe because her mother re re represents for Tala this force of nature that, that faced the world that was part of it and, and gives answers to so many of the questions that she has that are beyond, beyond that fence. So for me, Tala was about exploring the curiosity we have as teenagers or even as women in a world that in a system that makes us feel like our desires are something that that is not worth sharing and that is something that we that we should somehow feel ashamed of and so through Tala I felt uh, a lot of um, joy exploring I feel like I, I barely scratched the surface of it but she helped me yeah, I feel like the film, she came out of herself the more it, the more the film progressed. And I mean, I'm sure that so many women saw themselves also in Tala. I think it was one of those characters that was so rich and so untapped at the beginning of the film. And the irony is that, you know, she was freed by what happened, although it, you know, essentially destroyed the civilization that they'd built and protected it. It also made her in a way bit, you know, flourish. And this was incredible. I mean, there's many points in the film where Walid says over and over again, how free they are. 
Um, and he's specifically talking about the children, actually. He talks about both Rim and Tala many times. He says they have freedom and they have education. And yet the irony is that he's completely trapping them. He's not giving them either of those things because Tala, she ends up being so ill-equipped to cope with situations that, you know, she maybe would have been better able to, to deal with had she still been in Beirut. Um, so this was quite fascinating for me. But do you think that at the end of the film, Walid still truly believed this? Or do you think that there was a, there's a moment where he's looking out at the burning trash and he's crying. And I feel like that is a very significant moment where he realizes that, you know, he wasn't able to achieve uh, really what his heart wanted to achieve. Yes, I think, you know, like when, when it's also about, so I will, there's a lot of things that you said and, and um, so first of all, I think Tala's decision to say no to her father and to go with her mother in the end is, is something that requires a lot of courage for a girl like her who says, I want to go and discover that world. And, and because she understood, she doesn't have the tools that she needs um, and or as much as she wants to. And I think Walid's journey is, is, is a big one because he, he's a character driven by fear. And, and at the end of the film, he decides to go to that place that scares him the most, that place that represents the heart of all of his PTSD. And um, at that moment that you're referring to where Walid looks at the, imagines the garbage flying to the sky and his whole world becoming perfect magically. I think that's a moment that um, is a very important one for him because it's the moment where he realizes that um, his attempt to protect became a way to control and that everyone around him is unhappy. And that's where he understands that his fear is, is, is destroying that place and not protecting it. And it's the moment where he actually understands that he, he's powerless as a man, as a father, as a human being. And it's a very humbling moment for him. He realizes that he, there's no communication between him and the people he loves. Like when I was growing up, I felt like, of course, um, watching my family was a big part of my creative process, but also there are films like, for example, the film Burman, uh, my bird that made me realize you can talk about lack of communication between people through a family unity so well. And I think that moment is the moment where Walid understands how much his attempt to connect with his family has resulted in a total distance between him and everyone. And his decision to go to Beirut in the end, for me, is him saying, I'll, I'll get out of, of my, my I'll, I'll try to listen a little bit to others and I'll try to break free a little bit from my own fear, even if it's scary. Um, I, I'm just going to ask one last question before we go to questions from the audience. Um, I mean, I love happy endings. And for me, them splitting up at the end as a family was so heart wrenching. Um, in my dreams, I see them reuniting in Beirut. Is that something that you saw in yours? I want to ask both of you this question, because in my dream, they reunited and life was beautiful. <laughs> I need to hold on to that. Um. First about the team, I think Reem's decision to bring everyone in the city is is one that um, um, it's a lot of uh, I think it's a lot of power that this little girl regains in the end because he would never have left the house if it wasn't for Reem. Uh, and but about if they're gonna be together or not or reunite or not, I I like to believe that characters after a movie ends continue having a life of their own and independently from me. So we'll have to go look for them somewhere and ask them. <laughs> Nadine? I hope it will to have best both worlds because I think that that's what we are all, we'll all have to do at some point is really get the best of both worlds. Yes, and also I think <clears throat> Reem, whether the couple, Walid and Suraya, are going to be together or not, or whether they're going to be uh, living self-sustainably or not, I think the important thing is that they start listening to each other a little bit more. Ruth, I told the, the twins who played him that you're yes, really loved. I, I don't know if anybody knows, but the but Rim was played by twins. And uh, actually, they'd never acted before. This is their first uh, time acting. And also the grandmother, this was also her first time acting. She's actually the mother of a friend of Munia. And, and I yes, think her comic, her comic timing was genius. And I, I know from a lot of the laughter around that she was one of the favorites of the film. This was very special. 
Oh. I have a little video for you from the twins. Oh, no way. Thank you, Louis, that I have it on here. Love the Yeah, so shit. Actually, the, the, the character of Rim is one of my favorites, but I think that now that I've watched the film a second time, and I would encourage you all to watch it so many times, I want to watch it again straight away. Um, I, I have such a love for Walid, and I think maybe that's because I'm just a, I'm a hopeless romantic. And I just, you know, I want them to be together as a family. Anyway, I would love to hand the microphone over to everyone else um, because I'm sure everyone has so many questions. I don't know who's gonna negotiate this uh, the microphone situation, but I hope you all have questions because it's not very often you get these two incredible artists up on a screen. Who can I run and give this to? Uh, oh, you're gonna do it? Oh, you have another one, okay. And Munia, you have to send me that video from the twins, please. I will. It's precious. They're so big. Every time their mother sends me a video, I get so sad that they're growing so fast. <laughs> they look like other people. Diana and Jane. Hi, I just, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I just want to say thanks for such an amazing film. Um, we never see environmental destruction in films um, about Lebanon, and there's environmental destruction everywhere. Sometimes I look at the mountain and I feel like it's one big deforestation project. And so I really appreciate that that was central to the film. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, um, thank you for such an incredible metaphorical experience that was so calm and gentle and like really gentle, but very emotional at the same time. Um, one thing that really hit me about the film and I have this kind of big question for you was this notion of building our own utopia, you know? can a utopia exist? Because every single individual has their own version of a utopia that changes with time. And at the same time, I really have so many moments in my life where I'm so ready to just pack everything up and go on an abandoned island and free myself of everything that the modern day world has to offer. And I think, is it ever possible to build and sustain that utopia because what you see is that this family that has um, created this lived fantasy it slowly starts to get dismantled by small external introductions you know it starts off with the man in the suit and then he gets his machines and then the trash and then the outside world manages to kind of seep into this family and creates a huge separation between it. So I think that's my question. Is, is this film a sign that a utopia can exist once we're able to shut off the world or is it that a utopia can never exist? And yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, your voice is so gentle. I feel like you should give meditation classes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for uh, watching the movie with an open heart. Um, when it comes to um, uh, the utopia versus can, can that be created or not, because this family gets caught up uh, with reality, I think, because the, their version is a bit extreme. I think what I've accepted and understood, and that's personal to me, and I, I, I'm excited to hear also Nadine's uh, response, is that I feel like the world that we live in is dark, has always been dark. And it's about our relationship to it at, at this point. And if we consider, like recently, I was reading a lot about that uh, for another project that I'm working on. And, and I was reading about the, the idea of creating, like if considering that the world we live in is a, dyst is a dystopia, then how can we aim for getting to something, anything close to a utopia? And I think one of the solutions is the idea of, creating glimpses of light, light, glimpses of utopia in a world that feels otherwise dark. And, and because I, 
I, I don't think that the idea of a utopia is a realistic one. And that's, that's the idea of it. That's why it's called utopia. But I think trying to create instances uh, of light uh, and of, of, of poetry and of joy and of kindness in a world that feels otherwise dark is a way to somehow um, create echoes to that utopia in the world of today. And for me, that's as far as I, I, I would hope. And um, another like, thing that I recently uh, uh, spoke about as well is like this book that I read in architecture school by Italo Calvino, which talks about the world we live in, live in as hell. And so either we adapt to hell and accept that that's what it is, or we try to find within that hell what is not hell and start expanding it. And I think for me, this balance is something that I, I strive for. And I think the, the, the family, the Badri family went to a place of extreme. And I think trying to find somewhere in between where you still are part of, of, of of, of society in a way to contribute, but also try to give yourself the space to um, the, the the space that is needed to also nurture yourself and your relationship in nature. I think finding a balance is, is what I personally strive for. And I don't believe in, in bubbles of, of isolation because I think they explode in your face often. <laughs> Should I, should I go for my question? Yeah, um, so first I want to really thank you for the movie. It's just so amazing. I think as a Lebanese myself, I could relate so much. And um, particularly to the mental health um, issues which you raised. Um, and it's like really sad to like kind of see how, um, how Reem was kind of like, you know, coping with her anxiety like from the moment she started counting I realized that she has anxiety it was like very obvious um so my question here is like I, I mean I don't think we really spoke about Reem and I'm like particularly interested in her like um character um and the anxiety part like what like what where did this come from like um and why did you particularly just like pick this counting coping mechanism you know which is something like I don't think um, I was very familiar with, but like it was just very obvious that there's so much anxiety there. And another like question is just out of curiosity, like the tattoo on Nadine's arm, or like, like yeah, I think I saw the tattoo. Is it something just like specific for the movie, or is it just like a real tattoo that you have on your arm and you just kept it? <laughs> so I think those are my two like questions. Yeah, thanks. When Nadine and I started talking about the character, obviously she had so much in common with her that we were building together. And so, so we decided that there were certain details that needed to be pushed. Like, for example, uh, the, the bangs that Nadine cut, which is something that we thought she does at home and that brings her a bit closer to her daughter, is something that we created together. In the beginning, Nadine, you were like, no, I know you kept it. <laughs> And I'll let you speak about the rest and uh, that too. And no, I prefer that you talk about the tattoo and explain the significance of it. It's not. It's not. It's not a real tattoo. It's not a tattoo I have uh, usually. So, uh, yeah. Munya. <laughs> yeah. So there was three dates. Uh, one of them was the date that Tala was born. Uh, so it basically we created a number together. Uh, the tattoo of Nadine is a number that has three important dates for her. One of them being the birth of her daughter, the other one being uh, <clears throat> the October uh, Revolution, 2019. Uh, and uh, I think one of them was also when her and Walid met. Walid, however, had because well, we also created scars because they uh, it was a way to also translate their backstory in a visual way uh, with the Claudine Schrady who did the, the makeup. And another thing that, another tattoo we had on Walid is a drawing by Igon Chile with two people under a blanket. Um, 
that uh, I ended up doing as a tattoo myself as well. And it's on the chest of Walid and it's him and Suraya for him. And it translates the hopeless romantic that he is. And in terms of mental health, I think that, um, um, so I think that, yes, Reem has OCD. Reem is supposedly a character that's completely free in touch with nature, et cetera. But at the same time, the only world she knows is the world her parents have and her father has created for her. She's very much in touch with nature, but at the same time, she's the main def defender of her father's kingdom in a way that she subconsciously also sees Beirut as a threat and the people who are outside this fence as strangers. And so I think Reem represents the generation that has inherited the anxiety uh, uh, of her father without understanding where it comes from. He tells her, I'm going to Beirut. She says, what if it explodes? Or And her way of translating that subconscious anxiety is by, like her father, trying to control everything because in her mind, think and the part at the time. And OCD is something and counting is something that I uh, personally experienced for one year when I was a teenager or not like when, when I was 12. Like there's a big event that happened in my life around that time that shook my whole being. And my way of reacting to it was uh, through OCD. So I had this type of counting, like I would count and then if I would, there was always a theory in my mind. If I don't count till this number, then this will happen. So it was my way of controlling everything that's around me. And then I felt like it was something I invented on my own. And then when Google uh, uh, came into my life, I understood that I was not alone and something that many people uh, have and, and <laughs> et cetera. So it was my way of translating her anxiety through this obsessive counting. And at the end, that counting doesn't work. Her mother still leaves. Uh, despite the counting. And so she she loses that superpower and now has to develop other ones. Hi, Nadine and Munia. Thank you so much for this uh, amazing movie. Um, it's really a unique experience to be able to watch a film and then directly question um, the lead actress and director. So um, it, it's quite interesting. So thanks for your time for being here. Um, I think one, you know, we've touched on a lot of themes which really stood out, of course, is the theme of resistance, which resonates not only with the Lebanese, but other Middle Eastern expats, I mean, people that are living outside their countries, um, and, and this uh, the idea of your home living in you when it's in a suboptimal state that you need to escape from it. You've talked about sustainability and globalization. I think one other theme that really stood out for me, um, and I thought was really interesting how it was weaved into the storyline is the um, topic of women giving up sort of a strong, uh, successful career, um, whether it be it for a family or um, for a bigger principle in the case of Suraya. I'd love to hear from you if possible, um, you know, if this choice, and I'm sure it was intentional, and maybe talk a bit about why, um, especially that you're both, of course, very successful in your careers, and if this is something that you know you uh, personally related to or wanted to touch on in the movie, and sort of a bit about that choice in Suraya's character. You want me to talk about it, Munya? Ma'am Nisma. I would love to because I think you, Nadine, that's one thing that brought you together with Suraya is that you're a mother, you're a filmmaker, you're a wife, you're a lot of, like, I think it can be an interesting <laughs> thing for you to explore. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it, uh, of course, it's an ongoing struggle, but for me, I think um, I was able and I am able to find uh, my sanity in a way in the balance between those bo both worlds uh, I, I, obviously the, the one doesn't mean that I have to let go of the other uh, living in nature and uh, being close to nature and and experimenting and trying to be as 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 wise or, or trying to imitate nature's rhythm doesn't mean doesn't really mean that I have to give up on everything else or on living in the city from time to time or um or, or or working or traveling or exploring the world uh, on the contrary i think um i've i've sort of i can't say that i have found um exactly the right balance because i think that it's an ongoing um uh, search uh, but 
but I sort of am happy with this this balance that that I found. So I'm I'm trying really to um, also teach my children, or or we're trying to as a family to to live uh, this experience because you know I came across uh, a woman um, a few. Uh, a, maybe a year or two ago, I was I was I was uh, um, uh, at a, worst, a workshop about um, um, uh, about cooperatives. Sorry, I sometimes have like this blank um, about cooperatives because I wanted to learn more about the system of cooperatives and if it works or not, and if it it can be one of the solutions and. Um, and so I met this woman, um, and she and and she made complete sense to me because she told me, you know, Nadine, um, I can't um, imagine my my son uh, being a, a Harvard graduate without, uh, and 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 if he's you know walking in a forest and he steps on on a plant that um, that is very beneficial for his health and he doesn't know what is the name of this plant and he doesn't know what it is for and what it can you know what can, it can be beneficial for so I thought she made so much sense yes I, I think we've um, unfortunately we have we have um, um, I think insisted so much on on the on the knowledge and on the acad academic um, uh, level of our children and uh, of their education, and we, we forgot, uh, you know, to teach them so many other things that are related to sustainability and and self sufficiency and nature and agriculture and and uh, music and cooking and arts and so I, I think at some point in this transitional world that we are bound to create because we can't go back to really the world that we. Um, that we have known, uh, I think it's it's the only solution is really to find this right balance and 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 to understand and redefine our real needs as human beings and not as opposed to what we think we need as human beings. And I think this sort of culture of excessive consumerism and global capitalism has taught us, really has brainwashed us um, uh, to things or or, or had defined uh, success in, in 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 ways that are not necessarily uh, true to our human nature so I don't know if I answered the question but I mean, that's my take on it and I, I would ask because I'm also in terms of motherhood versus being a director like the the the, the bridge between those two for you uh, being a mother and a director, I, I, I do the same, which is, which is try to, you know, unite both worlds and, and live in both worlds at the same time. If you, if you see the way I work, it's, it's all, it, everything is, is all a, a huge, big, organized chaos where my personal life, my family life, my work life, my artistic life is all, you know, combined together in an organic way. And it, 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 it works uh, for me. It works for me. It works for my children. It works for my whole family. And I like it this way. So for me, it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't need to, it, it's a way of completing myself also as, as a woman. It, it makes me more complete to be able um, uh, to be a mother and be very present in my children's lives, but at the same time, be able to work and really um, um, be creative and, and be fulfilled with my work. I, I think it's, um, it's very natural for me to, to do both. Some people are a little bit surprised. Sometimes I was, you know, with, with my last film, Kfarna um, Home, uh, I was I was working and shooting for six months, but at the same time, I was also breastfeeding my my daughter. So I used to go to the shoot and then come back and 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 uh, breast uh, feed her and then go back to 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 the shoot. So so it and it and people ask me how did you do it? How uh, how hard was it? Actually, it, it, it was natural. It was organic for me to do this. And it allowed me to keep my sanity during the time where I was working because this allowed also this sort of 
I don't know, going back to, to my instinct and to my, to my, yeah, to my instinct as a woman and as a mother uh, was very, very important. So, yeah. That's it. <laughs> I mean, I think that as long as I've known you, this is really who you are as a woman anyway. I think that you've always been incredibly true to yourself. And um, this is one of the most lovable um, and, and really quite unique qualities about you is that you don't sacrifice anything to be who you are. Um, we have time for one last question because I think we're about half an hour running over. So I really, really love you both for the time that you've given all of us this evening. It's been such a huge honor to have both of you up there on the screen for the premiere in the UAE of this simply astonishing film. So um, one last question and uh, yeah, then we're gonna wrap it up. Hi, uh, my name is Hala and I live in Lebanon and I'm occasionally in Dubai. And I've never missed a Lebanese movie, but this movie especially uh, made me feel so happy, sad, anxious, all at the same time, because I felt like I'm seeing it from outside, from someone else's eyes on what has happened to Lebanon. I've seen myself in Walid, in Suraya, in Reem, in Tala, in the grandma, in everybody that was in this movie. So I have to thank you both for this. And uh, I actually had like a small preview and I was so anxious. I wanted to watch this movie because my friend has worked with you, Miriam uh, Sassin. And I- Of course. I, I am, uh, you guys astonished me. I love this movie. It made me cry. It made me laugh. <laughs> It made me. Miriam, Miriam did not just uh, work on the film. Miriam was the producer of the film and she produced yeah, this film in, in really circumstances. And this film is her baby as much as it is mine. Course, and it would not course. have happened. Love she but it. you guys are great. I love this. And uh, I've, I'm here occasionally. So I'm just staying for a couple of weeks. And I already miss home. I miss home. And uh, oh. I love this movie. Thanks, guys. Hala, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, so that's it, guys. Thank you so much. I feel so, so honored to have been here for this moment with the both of you. Munia, I love you. And uh, I look forward to getting to know you better. Nadine, I can't believe you did this for us on your birthday. <laughs> what other way to celebrate my birthday than with a... <laughs> A room full of uh, a theater full of people. I mean, it's the, the best, the best thing I can <laughs> <Yeah>. hope for. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, Thank I'm you so much. The, I'm I mean, coming this... up to the front because I want a photo with you, two of you on the on the screen. I'm not going to stand <laughs> on a table or anything, but yeah. <clears throat> of course, someone wants to wish you happy birthday. One sec. <laughs> happy birthday, Nadine. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we were always, well, I was you. always going to get people to wish you happy birthday and sing at the beginning. And then I was like, oh my gosh, she's going to absolutely kill me. I can't no. do that. <laughs> yeah. On the contrary. Yeah. I love you. No, no, I so love nice. you. I love you too, so much. Thank you so much, guys. Have a lovely, lovely weekend. You Thank too. You so much. Thank you, everyone, for, for staying. I guess yes. you can press stop now, unless you want to wave bye to us all. <laughs> oh, we're off now. Bye. <laughs> bye. Love you both. Bye. Take care. Love you. Bye. Bye.